talked about the visual system. <clears throat> so, uh, visual system belongs to your sensory systems and the sensory systems are divided into two types of sensory systems special senses special sensory system and somatosensory system. Okay. So, sensory systems are divided into those two types. Special sensory system processes special senses. And so, somatosensory system processes somatosensations. So, what are the special senses? Special senses include your vision or sight, audition or hearing, olfaction or smell gestation or taste. So, these are special senses. Sight, <coughs> hearing, smelling and tasting. Audition, audition, olfaction and gestation. Somato sensations are pain, touch, temperature, those are somato sensations, those you feel throughout the body, everywhere, touch, pain, temperature, right, you feel everywhere in the body surface. <coughs> but special sensations only occur through special organs. That's why it is called special sensation. Your sight or vision only occurs through what? Eyes. Audition only through the ears. Right? Perfection only through the nose. Gestation only through the tongue. So, you have special organs for special sensations, but somato sensations are very generalized throughout the body. Is it clear? Okay. So, in case of special senses, you have the receptors only in those specific organs. In case of somato sensations, you have receptors throughout the body like pain, touch, temperature receptors are throughout the body. Now, uh, today we will talk about the visual system. You know that the peripheral organs of the visual system are two eyes. Those are called the peripheral organs. So, we will talk about the eyes. First, we will see the parts of the eye. Then, we will talk about the eyeball. We will talk about the chambers inside the eyeball, layers in the wall of the eyeball, muscles, those help to move the eyeball, you know, you move the eyeball, right, to track the things, right, to see the things. So, you have 
some muscles around the eyeball those are called the extra ocular muscles outside of the eyeball but attached to the eyeball we'll see which muscles help you to move the eyeball then we'll talk about the regulation of light <coughs> when the light enters into the eyeball how the amount of light is controlled or regulated we'll see that we'll also see uh, the structures inside the eyeball and how the light is focused on the retina which is the most important part of the eyeball retina is the most important part of the eyeball because retina contains the receptors which receptors anybody photo receptors excuse me the rods and cones right photo receptors are in the retina that's why retina is very important so we'll see those things and then we'll see how the signal goes to the brain from your eyeballs first if you see the eye it has a number of structures you see eyebrow eyelids eyelashes okay you see the white part of the eyeball from outside only a part of the eyeball you can see from outside not the whole eyeball right only the front part and you see the white area that is called the sclera and then you see uh, the round very dark uh, part that is the pupil that is actually a hole inside the iris so around the pupil that structure is the eyes so those are the things you can see from outside now if you see the muscles around the eye those are the extrinsic eye muscles or extraocular muscles same thing there are six muscles four are straight muscles that's why those four are called rectus rectus means straight you must remember right you know rectus abdominis rectus femoris so straight muscles are rectus and there are two oblique muscles going like this so you see here if this is your eyeball the rectus muscles are how many four going like this you see here one is above the eyeball one is in the lateral side one is in the medial side one is below so superior rectus the one below inferior rectus the one in the lateral side that's the lateral rectus and medial side medial rectus now two obliques are like this you see this is the eyeball two obliques are going like this okay rectus like this public like this now you tell me if i contract the superior rectus this is superior rectus right contract the muscle which way the eyeball will move up right if i contract the inferior rectus down lateral rectus lateral medial rectus medial okay so those are the actions now public helps to do what rotate the eyeball because obliques are like this okay so obliques mainly help to rotate and rectus to move up down lateral or medial so now brain sends signal to those muscles through the cranial nerves right we'll see which cranial nerves control those muscles three cranial nerves here you see the picture of those muscles from the side you see two oblique four rectus now which cranial nerves control these muscles the 
oculomotor cranial nerve number 3 abducens cranial nerve number 6 and trochlea cranial nerve number 4 so 3 4 and 6 oculomotor trochlea and abducens those are the three cranial nerves control the extraocular muscles the oculomotor controls four muscles and abducens control one and trochlea control controls one so most of the muscles are controlled by the cranial nerve number three which is the oculomotor if i ask you uh, which cranial nerves control the extrinsic muscles you need to remember these names okay now we will see the eyeball which is the most important part of the eye eyelashes and those eye are, are, are less important right uh, so eyeballs why eyeballs are most important because you have the retina inside the photoreceptors there anyway so if you see inside the eyeball it has two chambers anterior chamber and posterior chamber so let me try to draw my drawing on very good but not too bad <laughs> so this is the eyeball and there is a lens here inside the eye so this lens is also called crystalline lens this crystalline lens separates the eyeball into two chambers in front of the lens this chamber is the anterior chamber and behind the lens this big space is the posterior chamber anterior chamber contains a fluid which is like water very thick that fluid water like fluid is called aqueous humor humor means fluid aqueous means water right aquatic park so aqueous humor is in the anterior chamber posterior chamber is filled with a jelly like fluid that jelly like fluid is called vitreous humor okay vitreous humor it's like jelly now the function of the fluid number one because of the presence of fluid the shape of the eyeball is maintained right it stays round so to keep the eyeball but to keep the shape of the eyeball you need the fluid number two the vitreous humor creates a pressure inside the eyeball that keeps the retina retina is here in the back part of the eyeball so the pressure of vitreous humor keeps the retina attached to the wall of the eyeball so which is very important otherwise retina retina will be detached 
So those are two important functions of the fluid. Make sense? Uh, now we'll see the layers. So those are two chambers. Now if you see the layers in the eyeball, it has three layers. The outermost layer is the fibrous layer. So, outermost layer is the fibrous layer. Very tough. And if you see the outermost fibrous layer, it forms two structures. The front part of fibrous layer here, you have the cornea. So this is only this part, about one fifth, uh, one sixth part of the outer surface, that's the cornea in the front. And this part is transparent. So the light can easily pass to the cord. The back fifth sixth part, that means this part of outer layer, about sixth part is the sclera, the white part of the eye. And this is opaque won't allow any light at all to pass through it. So, no light will pass through the most part of the outer layer. Only light will pass through the very front part of the outer layer and that's the part transparent. So, that is the outer layer forms those two structures. Then, the middle layer is called the vascular layer. So, middle layer has blood vessels, capillaries. That's why it is the vascular layer. Now, this middle vascular layer, see there, uh, middle layer. vascular layer. This layer forms a number of structure. The most part of this layer is called choroid. So, most part of middle layer is called choroid. The front part of middle layer forms a couple of structures there. So, we'll see the front part of middle layer. Okay. So, front part of middle layer forms the ciliary body like this. ciliary or okay. and also middle layer or vascular layer goes to the form and form the sclera. So this is the sclera. The front of the lens. And you know that the sclera has 
a hole inside it that is called the pupil. So basically, this is the sclera. We are seeing the section of the eyes. So sclera is actually round like this. It is a part of middle pascal layer. So this is the sclera. Uh, sorry. Iris. 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 Sclera we have talked about that. So middle layer is forming the iris too. So ciliary bodies, iris in the front part. The back part, that layer is called the choroid. In choroid, you have many capillaries, blood vessels. Exactly. And the hole inside the iris is called the pupil. So this is the pupil. Now, uh, the innermost layer, which is the sensory layer, is here. Only present in the back part of the eyeball, not in the front, like this. And this is the innermost layer, that's the sensory layer. So number T. Sensory layer. So three layers: outermost fibers, middle vascular, and innermost sensory. Sensory layer forms only one structure. That's the retina. So retina is the sensory layer. Makes sense? And only present in the back part. That's the innermost layer. So this is the retina of the eye. The most important structure of the eye is the retina. Why retina is the most important again? It has the receptors called the photoreceptors that must be activated to send signal to the brain. If receptors are not there, the brain will not get what? Signal brain will not receive the signal. So receptors send the signal to the brain. Everywhere you need the receptors, right? In your skin, if you don't have the touch receptors, if someone touches you, the brain will not get the signal. The receptors sending the signal to the brain. Okay? Very important. So those are the layers and the structures formed by those three layers. Make sense? Now, how the light goes from outside to the retina? You see here, when the light passes through the eye, it must pass through a number of things because you see a number of things here. So, which way the light enters? From the front, right? Because only light can enter from the front because other part is open. And the light enters. Who regulates the amount of light that will get in this pupil? You know, sometimes pupil is constricted, sometimes pupil is dilated, right? When People is dilated, more light is allowed to get in, right? When it is constricted, less light will be allowed. So that's why people changes, the size of the people changes. Now if I put flashlight, that means a lot of light is trying to get in, right? So what the people will do, will constrict. Because if a lot of lights get in, then the things will be blind. So it needs to control, you need to control the light. So, people will constrict. In dark condition, you have less light outside, right? At night, you have what? Less light. So, in that case, people will do what? Get bigger or smaller? Bigger. Because you have less light, right? So, people will try to 
get as much, you know, let as much as light get in. If I put flashlight on your eye, people will do what? Constant. So, um, people regulate the light. So, the light will pass through the people like this and then will pass through the lens. So definitely light has to pass through the cornea first, then through the aqueous humor, then will pass through the lens. So cornea first, then aqueous humor in this chamber, anterior chamber, light will pass through that. All those are highly transparent, then will pass through the lens. When the light passes through the lens, refraction occurs. Convergence of the light will occur. Bending of the light, that's called refraction, takes place. So the lens will converse the light to do what? Put the light exactly on the retina. This is the retina. So the lens always focuses the light on the retina. Make sense? That is very important. This lens is a flexible lens. That means what? Flexible, not fixed. Changes the shape, right? And it is changing its shape all the time. Highly flexible. Not only highly transparent, but highly flexible. Lens doesn't have any blood vessels, any nerve. If there are blood vessels, then what is the problem? The light will be blocked, right? When it will try to pass through the lens, light will be blocked. So, there is no blood vessel, no nerve fibers. That makes the surgery easy, right? With, without almost no bleeding, you can take it, cut it. So, highly transparent protein fibers form the lens. Anyway, now the function of the lens is focusing the light exactly on the retina. Now, if your lens cannot focus the light on the retina, what will happen? you will have blurriness in the vision because to see the things clearly the light must be focused exactly on the retina if the lens for example your lens uh, is focusing the light here or here front or behind then what will happen you won't see the things clearly, right? Fuzzy. And that happens, you know. So in that case, you need to do what? Bring the focus point exactly on the retina. Make sense? Move the focus point exactly on the retina. So that's why you use what? Glasses, right? So two types of glasses, right? One type will push the focus point back. One will move the, bring the focus point front, right? So, either this way or that way. The purpose is focusing exactly on the retina. But the problem is that doctors, they don't know when the light is exactly focused on the retina without just doing the, changing the glasses. That's the way they, they know, yes, light is focused on the retina. When you say yes, depends on you, right? Trial and error, uh, asking you, do you see, is it better? Then when you say, yeah, now I see very clearly, then they know, yes, light is focused exactly on the retina, right? So they are doing from outside, just changing and uh, asking you. So, 
Now, uh, two types of lenses are used. One is uh, called convex and another is concave. Okay, these are two types of okay, lenses. Now, if someone uh, is having problem uh, because of light has been focused behind the retina, then you have to do what? You have to use because this con convex, from this one, you know that this is a convex lens, right? Your lens of the eye is a convex lens. So it converges the light, right? So in this case, to move it this way, you have to converse more, right? Bend more. Like you see, this is here. Then if I bend more, it will get here, right? So bend it forward. So you will add another convex lens. Make sense? To bring it here. And this condition is called hyperopia. Hyperopia. So in hyperopia, you have to use convex lens in the glasses to bring the focus point on the retina. And Hyperopia is also called far sightedness. Far sightedness. That means what? The person can see the far things. Far sightedness. And opposite is called myopia. If the focus point is in front of the retina, that is called what? Myopia. This is short sightedness or near sightedness. That means you can see the near things, but you have problem in seeing the far things. In this case, to push the focus point on the retina, you have to use opposite type of lens. That's the what? Concave lens. So it will first diverse the light a little bit, and then the lens will converge. So it will go to the Great. So, in nearsightedness or myopia, you use concave lens. In farsightedness or hyperopia, you use the convex lens. The goal is bringing the light focus point on the head. Now, you tell me a simple question. Uh, if I move this object towards my eye, the size gets what? Bigger or smaller? If it comes closer, bigger, right? So, which way the lens should change? When the thing gets bigger, you have to converse more. Make sense? Like, here it is bigger, far smaller, right? So when I bring it closer, the lens has to converse more. From from big structure, the picture is going, right? So the lens, as we bring the things near, the lens will get more round. Make sense? As we move away, the lens gets what? More flat. So when you try to see the things far, flat close things near. Make sense? Uh, so, that is just uh, uh, why the lens must be flexible. Uh, so, that's the hyperopia myopia. Now, there is another condition that happens due to uneven surface of the cornea or lens. If the surface is not smooth, uneven surface in the cornea or lens, that can cause problem in vision. That is called astigmatism.
due to uneven surface of the cornea or lens. Sometimes the proteins inside the lens, it is a bisect protein fiber, sometimes the protein can lose the transparency and cloudiness of the lens can occur. And that is called what? Pattern. Cloudiness of the lens. So the light will not be able to pass uh, easily. So the vision will be not clear. Okay, so uh, those are a couple of clinical conditions. As you know, when the kids grow fast at puberty, body grows fast, right? What happens sometimes? Uh, the eyeball is a soft organ, soft tissue organ. The eyeball can grow faster than the bones here. So what? happens that eyeball tries to get bigger faster but bone is not growing as fast so what happens pressure is created on the eyeball make sense because the orbit is not getting bigger as fast as the eyeball is going so pressure right? yeah then the eye will get elongated because pressure is from around right so I will get what long this one. so now just think that this is normal eye but from around the eyeball is getting pressure so what will happen the eyeball will get elongated right so the retina in this case is now here. Retina has moved further away from the lens. But lens doesn't know that. Okay? So lens will do what? Lens will focus the light here where the actual retina was before. So that causes what? Myopia that causes myopia because the focus is now here but the retina has moved further back so that's why you see the young kids start to use the glasses right complain that when the body grows they complain the problem of vision start to use the eyeglass <coughs> Okay, iris. Uh, iris is a muscle in which there is a hole in the center that is called the pupil. Now, the iris has two types of fibers, muscle fibers. In the outer part of the iris, you have radial fibers and in the inner part you have circular fibers. So now if you see the iris, this is the iris, this is the pupil and inner muscle fibers are round or circular like this and outer muscle fibers are radial. Some places you will see they say longitudinal. So radial fibers, so inner circular, outer radial. fibers. And when the circular muscle fibers contract, the pupil gets what? Smaller, make sense? smaller. When the radial fibers contact, now you see, if 
from around the radial fibers will pull the circular fibers. So the people will get bigger. So the circular muscle fibers are not contracting, they are in relaxed condition. Which muscle fibers are contracting? The radial fibers. So this one is relaxed and radial fibers are pulling it from all around. So the people will get bigger. Okay. That's the dilatation or dilation of the people. So constriction and dilation occurs. To do what? To regulate the amount of light that will enter into the eye. Uh, I mentioned before, if you are in bright light condition, okay, you have a lot of light around, in that case people will constrict, like in uh, sun, when you look at the sun, people will do what? Constrict. You are looking for your friend's house at night, okay, so the people will dial it, will try to get more light, okay, from outside. Sympathetic stimulation, you know, sympathetic, parasympathetic, two types of autonomic. Sympathetic stimulation will dilate the people. Parasympathetic constricts the people. Uh, like you are sitting, relaxed, someone is petting you. <laughs> what will happen? Parasympathetic, right? Comfortable, relaxed condition. Parasympathetic activation will occur, right? So the people will get what? Smaller, constricted. So if I, if you pet your cat, <laughs> okay, there's parasympathetic, you know, parasympathetic activation occurs in relaxed and comfortable condition. If you are scared, sympathetic activation occurs, right? Excitement, then people will dilate. So, here you see uh, in this picture, parasympathetic activation constricts the people, sympathetic activation dilates the people. So, those are other conditions. Uh, now, the most important structure is that retina. Retina has two layers, pigmented layer and neural layer. Pigmented layer is the outer layer and neural layer is the inner layer. Now, pigmented layer, just know that, absorbs the light. So, the pigments, rhodopsin and uh, rhodopsins, those are the pigments, opsins, just no opsins, O-P-S-I-N-S, opsins. In the rods, you have rhodopsins, in the cones, you have protopsins. Uh, those are the protein pigments, they absorb the light quickly. When the light falls on the retina, quickly they will absorb, which is very important. If, just think that if light falls on the retina here and then retina reflects the light, pushes it back, sends it back, that is not helpful, right? Retina has to do what? Absorb the light, take it, receive it inside. If the light is reflected on the retina surface, what you will see if you look someone at someone's eye, what you will see? Right, exactly. But we see what? We see very dark. Because light is getting in, but quickly being absorbed. So, no light is getting out, right? So, that's why it is dark, very dark. Light is sucked by the red. Quick, make sense? Now, uh, neural layer has the photoreceptors and other cells. 
So not only photoreceptors, but you have other cells in neural layer. Photoreceptors are two types, rods and cones. If you see a retina, the this one, the center part of the retina has a lot of cones. The so cones are located in the center part of the retina. Okay, in the center part of the retina, you have the cones. And in the very center part of the retina, you have cones in very high density. That means a lot of cones are in this part. And that is called the fovea centralis. Fovea centralis. And Around the fovea centralis, you have the area that is called macula lutea. You have a lot of cones there too, but in the center, in fovea centralis, you have huge number of cones. Fairly packed. The cones are in human retina, the cones are three types. Do you know that? So if I see this part, I'll see what? Three types of cones. Red, green and blue. So, three types of cones. R, G, B. Red, green, and blue. Three types of cones. When I say three types of cones, that means what? The red cones are sensitive to red color, right? Blue cones are sensitive to blue, green cones are sensitive to green. What do you mean green color, red color, blue color? Color is actually the length of the light waves. Okay? So, three types of length of light waves will stimulate the three types of cones. That's why we say red cone, green cone, blue cone. Actually, they don't have color. The cones don't have color, right? Because they are stimulated by those colors, wavelengths. And now, if red is stimulated, we see red. Green is stimulated, we see green. Blue is stimulated, we see blue. How you see yellow or all, uh, many other colors? If we stimulate, yeah, by combination of two or more, right? So, if a light that is stimulate both red and green, then what you will see? If you mix the red and green, right? You will see the yellow or orange color. So how much you are mixing, right? So that, so that's why you see so many colors, even yellow, different hues, right? Uh, intensities. So it depends how much you are activating reds and greens. So, now you know that uh, color blindness, have you heard that? Or color deficiencies that happens due to absence of any type of cones, one or more. Absence of one or more types of cones. If someone has absence of red cones or red sensitive cones, then the person or see the color red that is called red color blindness. Make sense? Sometimes we see both red and green. Uh, uh, some creatures they have 
more different types of cones. So their perception of color will be much better, right? And higher than human. Some creatures they have only two types of cones, so they see less colors. Okay. Uh, for example, a bee uh, when a bee sees a flower, right? It sees much more colors in it than human. You know, ultraviolet, infraviolet colors. Yes. Um, so like. Right, they see less color. Monkey ha monkeys have two, so monkeys see uh, more, you know, uh, gray color, less color. So we said dichromatic, monochromatic, you know, uh, polychromatic visions. How many colors you, you have? Uh, color sensitive cells. In Okay, so uh, for the receptors, <coughs> rods are located in the outer part of the retina. So rods are in the peripheral part of the retina, and rods help to see in dim light. They get excited. In dim light condition. Now you tell me. A little bit tricky. I said rods help you to see in dim light, less amount of light, and the cones help you to see in bright light. Okay. So at night when you want to see something, you, your eye uses which one? Rods, right? And at data, cones. Now, you tell me, which one is more light sensitive? Rods or cones? Rods. Make sense? Because small amount of light can excite the rods. Make sense? To excite the cones, you need what? Bright light. So, rods are more sensitive to light than the cones. Now, cones are responsible for bright light or daylight vision. Bright light vision. Number two, cones are responsible for color vision. Cones are responsible for visual acuity. What is visual acuity? The ability to see in very small things. The ability to see very small but in fine detail. So if you want to read something very small, you use rods or cones? Cones. Because visual acuity is the ability to see the small, very small things and fine things, fine detail. So now, to see the things, very small things, you must use the cones. So you see, cones are located here, here right? In the center. So if you look at something straight, then the light will go there. Straight. If you see something here, but uh, something is here, but you are looking this way, then the light will go this way, right? From this one, will fall here or here. Make sense? Because you are not looking straight. You are looking this way, but the object is here. Or the object is here, you are looking this way, right? So what will happen? The light will go to the outer part of the retina. So 
for visual acuity you need to see straight that's why when you read small things you need to look what straight otherwise you won't be able to read make sense okay so these are the functions you know when you go to eye doctor uh, they do what visual acuity test right ask you try to read the smallest how small you can read or see not read actually the they test how small you can see because if someone says i i can't read then what they will do they will show the picture right so the task is how small you can see the thing really that's the visual acuity okay uh so those are the functions of cones now rods are just responsible for dim light vision dim light vision now if you want to see stars at night you will use what cones uh, sorry rods and rocks are located in the outer part so if you look straight you won't be able to see clearly make sense so that's why the trick of uh, seeing the star people know from like oh time although they don't know the mechanics of eye but they know the trick that they have to look a little bit off from the star so uh, that's the function of those are the functions of rocks now there are a uh, couple other structures in the retina the nerve fibers get out from the part of retina and this part of the retina is called the optic disc actually the optic disc is little bit off from the center so let me draw this is the center of the retina so fovea centralis and uh, macula lutea now little bit off from the fovea centralis this is the area from where the nerve fibers arise and this area is called the optic disc which is also called blind spot optic disc or blind spot why this is called a blind spot because you see nerve fibers arise from there and there is no photoreceptors in this part blood vessels also enter into the eye through this area so blood vessels and nerve fibers are attached there so no photoreceptors are there that's why the optic disc is also called the blind spot it is not in the center of the retina center of the retina is very important where you have lot of cones it is off from the center so just a question yeah Which shows the optic nerve moving down from the fovea. Yeah, yeah, just uh, it it is actually down, so uh, it's not in the center, off from the center. Okay, yeah. So that's the optic disc. It is here. So the the purpose that I said is not in the center, but off from the center. So blood vessels. enter optic nerve uh, also is attached here okay uh, now uh, then why you don't see a hole when you see something if there is a blind spot in the retina you should see what the dark area because 
there is a gap inside the retina, right? Where you don't have any photoreceptors there. You should see a dark hole. But we don't see. Your brain has the ability to fill that blank. That is number one. Number two, your two retinas are not exactly located in a way that they are superimposed exactly. A little bit off. So, your right and left retina are seeing the things in slightly different locations. If you open and close your right and left eye, you will see the thing is moving this way, right? Like this. So, the picture is falling on two retinas in slightly different locations. So, that is another reason you don't see the hole. Is that, is that, is that what gives you stereoscopy? Vision, yeah, yeah. Bi binocular vision. You know, that depth perception. Mm -hmm. If I ask you to feel a thread in a needle with one eye, you won't be able to do that. You need two eyes, right? Even if I ask you to put two pencils, put them together with one eye, it will be difficult. You will miss. Make sense? You need two eyes to do that. That is the fine depth perception, exactly what you said, stroboscopic. Fine depth perception. That is given by two eyes, two retinas. One eye cannot do that. Okay? Very important. And the 3D movies and 3D things that are created on 2D surface is based on that. So, we know that Retina has rods and cones, photoreceptors, but I told you that retina has other types of cells too. You need to remember those other cells. The photoreceptors, you see here, this is the pigmented layer, opsins. These are tiny dots, you see, these are opsins, pigments, absorb the light. And then, these are the photoreceptors, the blue ones are the rods, and these are the cones. Very simple name, right? Rods look like what? Rods. Cones are cone-shaped. And from the rods and cones, bipolar cells take the signal and give the signal to the ganglion cells here. These are very important ganglion cells. Why ganglion cells are important? Because you see here, from the ganglion cells, the axons arise and these axons are bundled together to form this nerve, the optic nerve. So, optic nerve is actually the bundle of axons of ganglion cells. The bundle of axons of those ganglion cells form the optic nerve. So remember the name of the cells. Rods and cones are photoreceptors. You have bipolar cells, ganglion cells. There are a couple other types of cells. Amacrine and horizontal. So I need you to remember all those names. Photoreceptors. That means what? Rods and cones. Then you have bipolar cells, you have ganglion cells, you have amacrine cells and horizontal cells. It seems a little counterintuitive that all of these cells and the, the uh, axon fibers all in front of the photoreceptors. It seems like it should be flipped if you want the maximum yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting thing. Uh, interestingly, it is split. What happens, you see, the light, this is, this is very interesting, the light, you know, comes this way, because this is the outer, right? This is inner. So, we have the photoreceptors In this side, in the back. 
so light gets this way then why the light doesn't stimulate these cells directly right that's the question so what happens actually the light without stimulating this light cannot stimulate these cells light passes through the spaces in degree and absorb here and then stimulate the cells then go that way. that's that's the interesting thing that light will first go through that layer retina and will go to the back and stimulate the receptors and then will come this way so th th that is something you know Do all interesting have the same i don't know but the, in human definitely the light will pass through and go to the back stimulate the photoreceptors first and i think other creatures like you know rodents have same way so th that is something interesting that light is first going passing through all through and then stimulate then the signal is coming back that way next one so this layer is very transparent for the light for the light uh, this retina is transparent <coughs> okay here you see the photograph of a retina you can take a picture easily you know sometimes if you go to ophthalmologist they put a drop right and ask you to wait to dilate the pupil and when the pupil gets very dilated white then you can take the picture because we know retina is in the back so you have to pass through the pupil so now you can see here the optic disc the area where the optic nerve is attached and blood vessels pass uh that area is the optic disc or blind spot you see macula lutea that area is dark red because you have lot of cells cones there that's why so when you take the picture you see that area is dark uh, now uh you have heard talk about the lens cloudiness of the lens hyperopia myopia astigmatism the focusing of the light we have talked about that focusing in front in the back myopia hyperopia the lens we have talked about those last thing the visual pathway so uh from the retina optic nerves take the signal out and two optic nerves join at optic chiasma you have seen that in brain dissection right remember optic chiasma you did the brain dissection right okay so optic chiasma where two optic nerves join and here something happens A lot of fibers go to the other side cross over like this takes place but many fibers stay also in the same side so you see here the temporal fibers this is the temporal side this is the nasal side is there in case of vision so these fibers are staying in the same side and these fibers are going to the other side so cross over uh, also takes place in the chiasma so that is that means what your both sides of the brain is getting signal from both eyes right and after the optic chiasma those fibers again bundle together and form the optic tracts now optic tracts have the fibers from both eyes but optic nerves have the fibers from each eye each nerve has fiber from fibers from each eye then optic tract give signal to three structures most of the signal goes to the thalamus here this is thalamus lateral geniculate nucleus of thalamus thalamus has different areas 
the area receives the visual signal from the optic tract, the lateral geniculate nucleus. Most of the signal goes to the thalamus, but small amount of signal also goes to other two structures. You see those two round pretectal nucleus and the superior colliculus. How many of you remember superior colliculi? Have you heard that term? This side? Yeah. How about you guys? Do you remember superior colliculi? When did you see superior colliculi? Do you remember? Forgot everything? The back, right, of the midbrain. I opened like this and showed you four round structures when you dissected. Upper two are bigger, lower two are smaller. Upper two are hard. Superior colliculi, lower two are inferior colliculi. Right? So, some visual signal at that time I mentioned also go to superior colliculi. Some signal goes to pretectal nucleus. Okay, now three structures receive the signal from the optic tract. From the thalamus, the signal goes to primary visual cortex. You need to remember the previous things to connect, otherwise no point of, you know, uh, like uh, moving forward, you will not be able to uh, grasp it. So, how many of you remember primary visual cortex? Is it in the back? Right, all the way in the back of the occipital lobe, right? You have seen that. So, from the thalamus, signal is sent to the primary visual cortex because that's the main visual cortex that receives the signal to give you the sight, the vision. To give you what? Picture. Now the question is then why signal should also go to superior colliculus? If thalamus gives the signal to the primary visual cortex and you see the picture, then why signal should go to superior colliculus and pretectal nucleus? Superior colliculus sends signal to those three cranial nerves. You remember help in movement of the eye? Control the six muscles, right? Three nerves. Oculomotor, abducens, trochlea. So, from superior colliculus, signal goes through those cranial nerves to the extrinsic eye muscles to do what? Move the eye. You not only see, to see, you have to move the eye. Like if I move something like this, you have to move the eye, otherwise you don't see. So, signal should also go to the extrinsic eye muscles. And pretectal nucleus has a little bit different function that's the reflex when I push flash light you remember your people will do what constrict right so reflex people are reflex that must be controlled by something so that's the pretectal nucleus that the reflex reflex pretectal nucleus yeah. that's why you have those three structures there one is for the voluntary movement of the eye, another is for the reflex, another is for the picture, image, giving you the image of something. So that's the pathway of the visual signal. Now the last thing here you see from the thalamus, signal goes to the primary visual cortex. The fibers take that signal, those are called the optic radiation, this fibers like this. Optic radiation. So, retina, optic nerve, optic chiasma, optic tracts, then those three structures, right? Thalamus, pretectal nucleus, superior colliculi. Then from the thalamus, signal goes where? Right to the primary visual cortex, right? And gives you the picture. From the optic tract, some signal goes to the superior colliculi, that signal goes through the cranial nerves to the eye muscles, right? To move the eye And pretectal nucleus to give you the reflex. 
So that's the pattern. You are um, talking about stereopsis. So the signal your brain needs for stereopsis or uh, visual depth perception, fine depth perception or discrimination is the binocular disparity. Just know that that's the cue your brain needs from the eyes. What's the name of that cue? Binocular disparity for fine depth. What is binocular disparity? I mentioned. If you see something with the right and left eye, you see the picture is in slightly different location in space, right? You know that? Most like this. That means your right and left eyes are seeing the things in slightly different locations in space. Make sense? And your brain needs that difference. Brain will calculate that difference and will give you the perception of point. Very important cue. Uh, I did a uh, lot of experiments on monkeys to test the binocular disparity that wash you. And, uh, you know, on the computer screen, if you can create two, this is very simple, I can create two sets of dots, like one set of dots here, okay, and another set of dots here, just next to it, slightly different location, two sets of dots, slightly different location. And now, one set is green, another set is red, okay? And if I give you that glass, you know, red-green goggles, that does what? Blocks, red will block the red, green will block the green, right? So, each eye is getting what? Only one set of dots. And sending brain, that one set of dot in here, another set of dot is slightly here, different, right? The brain is getting the signal from two eyes, but the dots are in slightly different locations in space. Make sense? But on 2D surface, here, brain doesn't know from where the signal is coming. Brain will just calculate. That's only brain does. Brain doesn't see outside, it's sitting in the dark cavity. So the brain fills in the information that's needed to see it as one dot or two dots? No, brain doesn't feel anything. In your brain, you have some neurons in particular area that those neurons can tell that the dots are coming from slightly different locations. Those are called binocular uh, disparity sensitive neurons. Only those neurons are sensitive to disparity. That signal is coming from different locations. Make sense? So the brain in terms of Yes, those. Actually, the brain is getting from two spots because you are filtering one for each eye. Make sense? So this eye is seeing in this location. One eye is seeing only red. Another eye is seeing only green, right? So brain, we are sending the signal to the brain that two different locations. So that when those neurons are activated, you see the so that's how we create depth in 2D, like in the book or on the computer screen. We can create the depth. And interestingly, we <coughs> found those neurons, these petty sensitive neurons. Then uh, at my main work was uh, I created a device that's called injector. I named it injector. And we are able to record those neurons. That area is in the deeper part of the occipital lobe, okay, very small, very tiny area, highly disparity sensitive. So, what I did, I found that area and injected uh, GABA agonist that will temporarily inactivate the, those neurons, suppress those neurons, okay. And then, when I uh, let the monkey to see the 3D on computer screen, they are completely lost. That means those neurons are essential for that, you know, depth discrimination. Is 
see this thing. Then after a couple of hours, when the drug effect is gone, then they start to perform like 100% cat. But when you inactivate those neurons, they are like 50%. It's randomly they are, just, you know, so you put. Grab it's, uh, it's not grabbing task. It's like uh, uh, two kind of task we give them. One is uh, pressing a computer button. If you see far, press this one. If you see near, press this one. And you need to train the monkey for.